Good afternoon, I'm Adam Lupel, IPI Vice President, and it is my honor to welcome you to this Global Leaders Series event, a conversation with His Excellency, Mr. Khalid Al-Yemeni, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Yemen on recent developments in the political process in Yemen. This conversation comes at a critical moment for the people of Yemen. Following the success of difficult UN-mediated negotiations in Stockholm, progress on implementation has been minimal, as the humanitarian consequences of four years of war continue to mount. By some measures, 80% of the population is in need of humanitarian assistance. The Stockholm Agreement, which is planned to be implemented in phases, remains the basis for what would be the beginning of a peace process that could bring the armed parties closer to an end to the conflict. Taking force on December 18th of last year, the parties agreed to three principal elements. An agreement on the city of Hodeida and the ports of Hodeida, Salif, and Ras Issa, the establishment of an executive mechanism on activating a prisoner exchange, and the formation of a joint committee on the city of Taiz, which would include civil society and the participation of the United Nations. The Accord on Hodeida, which has garnered the most attention, called for an immediate ceasefire in the city and the ports, a mutual re redeployment of forces from the city and the ports, including a handover of security responsibility to local security forces, and the establishment of the Redeployment Coordination Committee, the RCC, which is chaired by the United Nations. The Security Council swiftly endorsed the agreement in Resolution 2451, authorizing the Secretary General to deploy a team to monitor compliance with the ceasefire. And this was followed on January 16th with Resolution 2452, establishing a UN special political mission to support the Hodeida Agreement. Progress on these three points, uh, to say the least, has been slow. The UN-chaired RCC has succeeded in bringing the parties together post-Stockholm, but the past month has seen continued ceasefire violations and no agreement has been made on the composition of the local forces that would take over security responsibilities in Hodeida. The situation remains tense and uh, exceedingly complex. And so we are genuinely fortunate to have Ms. Minister Al-Yemeni here today to give us his view of the recent developments and help us all to better understand where things might go from here. The minister has had a long-standing career in the Foreign Service of Yemen, serving in posts in Kuala Lumpur, Washington, London, and New York, uh, and, and, a, and a stint in Cuba, I, we were just, was just revealed in our pre-conversation, including in New York as Deputy Permanent Representative to the United Nations in 2013 and Permanent Representative from late 2014 to mid-2018, uh, at which time he became Foreign Minister. In addition to being a PR, in 2015 he served as Deputy President of the UN General Assembly, uh, and so he is uh, no stranger in this neighborhood. Uh, we can see that he has a number of friends in this room. Um, so we are welcoming him back to his former home. Uh, the minister will speak uh, for about 15, 10, 15 minutes. Then we will have a short uh, conversation here. And then after that, we should have uh, plenty of time for Q&A. And so with that, please uh, join me in welcoming Khalid Al-Yemeni to the podium. Minister, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to see so many familiar faces, friends, uh, amigos. Uh, uh, it's a lot uh, to me to be here among brothers and friends and let's see old guys, new guys. and. Let me just uh, be brief in, in, in introducing the, the topic. For the last four years of this conflict, for the first time, 
of this conflict. Uh, in Stockholm, we thought that we ar arrived into unimplementable steps. We thought that uh, by having the Stockholm agreements, the three Stockholm agreements, as my friend just mentioned, the, the Hodeida agreement and uh, another agreement on the prisoner uh, exchange, and the third one on, on uh, ties, uh, lifting the siege over the city, uh, we thought that we have a proposal that will build trust between the government of Yemen and the uh, uh, Houthis in, uh, in, 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 in Sana'a. Uh, what's happened after four months? Uh, nothing, really. It's very sad, uh, but it seems that nothing is sometimes is unfair to say, because there is huge efforts being displayed by the office of the Secretary General uh, through his special envoy uh, efforts on the ground to restrain and not to uh, take the, the instigations of the Houthis and, and, and start a fresh war in Hodeida. Our army has received 3,500 uh, violations. Uh, and, and, and we started, when we started this process, the satellite imaging over Hodeida was, was showing 70 uh, trenches digged in, in the city. If you see now the satellite images, there is more than 750 uh, trenches digged in, 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 in Hodeida from the Houthi side, which shows that they are turning Hodeida uh, similar like Hanoi in, in, in the war of Vietnam. And, uh, and, 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 and in, in the and that in the idea, the false idea that if we would, if they would draw from Hodeida, the government of Yemen forces and the coalition will take over, and we, as a responsible partner, uh, um, um, taking our 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 promises seriously, and we signed an agreement in, in Stockholm. We think that we should stick to it, and we send a lot of assurances to the Houthis through the special envoy through all. Uh, our friends in the Security Council, that no one will take over. Hodeida is the beginning of this war, to put the end of this war. And, and, and for us to have this war winding up, we need, we, we have only two conditions, that we cannot have a replica of Hezbollah in Yemen. If the Houthis are willing to be part of the political process, we will welcome them anytime. We never consider them as a terrorist organization. So we are looking at them as partners in the, in, the, in the future of Yemen, but only if they are disarmed and accept to, to hand back arms and ammunition, especially heavy arms and missiles and drones and all these technologies that they brought from Iran and, uh, and hand it back to the state. Uh, other than that, they can be uh, contributing to the future uh, uh, fabrics of the nation. So this is, this is basically uh, the sad story that we did everything it takes, even the humanitarian side. There is uh, a lot of work is, is, is being, uh, I mean, displayed in Hodeida to enhance the, the passage uh, of humanitarian relief operations. They are blocking that uh, passages. They are blocking a very huge amount of wheat uh, in, in the Red Sea mill. Uh, inside areas controlled by the government of Yemen, and they are refusing to, to cooperate with World Food Programme to access the last attempt against the convoy. The UN convoy was two days ago when they shelled the area, and uh, the General Louis Gard was heading the convoy to access the, the Red Sea Mill. So we are facing difficulties, and we are trying to, to ease this sort of worries that the Houthis are, are putting forward. And we are trying to, to explain to them that we consider the government of Yemen, the coalition, we consider failure not an option in, in, in Hodeida, and we consider Hodeida as the starting point for the durable peace in Yemen. How they look at it, they look at it from the Iranian tactics of negotiation. They know uh, the last answer Three days ago, when I was talking to Martin, he said, I'm going to, to try for the last time to, to, to salvage the, the, the agreement and see if Houthis are willing to, to be on board. 
And the, the, the answer that he got from the leadership, this is the fourth, after, after eight visits to, to, to Sana'a, this is the fourth time that the leadership of the Houthis are saying, we are willing to withdraw from Hodeida. They say it in the leadership level, we are withdrawing. But on the ground, nobody is withdrawing. They are digging more trenches, they are sending more reinforcement to the area, we showing that there is really this, uh, this Iranian tactic in the negotiation. We very nice in, in, in when, when it comes to political talks and very ugly and rough when it comes to the local commanders on the ground. Uh, this is the challenging point. On the prisoner exchange, we also we stuck with, the, with them because the agreement was established in Stockholm by saying we free everybody, all for all. So we ended up by, for, the, for them is to fragment that agreement. Okay, we release 50, you release 20, and we said, uh, uh, nevertheless, the president accepted the deal of releasing 1,700. But they, they said in one moment, no, because they block, because we have also coalition members in that uh, prisoner exchange. They block them in order, in, in order to instigate the coalition and make them against any, any agreement. We said, we need to release everybody. We can't take the first uh, uh, batch of that, but there is no real interest with the Houth, in, 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 in the Houthi side to take the agreement, work hard to implement the trust building measures in order to step up the process of, of gaining trust and putting an end to this war. On the third topic, which is the, the, the ties, you know that Taiz is almost a liberated uh, uh, city, uh, but we have only uh, to, to open the humanitarian access. Houthis are controlling two major humanitarian access to the city, and they are using this, this sort of access to uh, blackmail the, the population, uh, loot the humanitarian relief operations, and, and, and block any attempt to, to normalize the life in, 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 in Taiz. We try to reach an agreement with them to lift the siege over, uh, over uh, Taiz, but they think that they will gain by just thinking on how to reposition themselves within, within Taiz. This is something that we cannot negotiate. We think that we are putting an end to this war, not to reestablish lines of conflict. Uh, uh, this is basically. Now, if I may, jump a little bit to the, to the, to the regional impact of this conflict. Uh, last month I was in, in Brussels and I was talking to, to uh, Ms. Mogherini and other foreign ministers from EU, and they were telling me that, uh, that the Stockholm Agreement were reached because Iran played a positive role by instructing the Houthis to accept the deal. So my, my direct question was, oh, correct. Uh, great that they accepted. Why they are not instructing them now to implement what they agreed upon? And they said, no, something happened from Stockholm uh, upward that, uh, that the Iranians are facing more sanctions and uh, they are facing more difficulties, so they changed their mind. Few weeks ago, uh, two weeks ago, maybe 15, 16 days, in the, the last meeting of EU4 plus Iran, uh, a senior diplomat from the, uh, the, the foreign service in Iran was telling the European partners, look, we give you a lot on Yemen, but in return we get nothing. Iran is looking for rewards when it comes to the Yemeni crisis, which we cannot offer Iran because we consider Iran as, as, as part of the conflict and we cannot agree with Iran on these rewarding issues. They have issues in Syria, they have issues in, 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 when it comes to the sanctions with, with the United States, and this is nothing to do with Yemen. We ask them to be cooperative when it comes to Yemen, and we will recognize if they agree to push the Houthis out of Hodeida and to be more constructive when it comes to, to durable peace in Yemen. But we don't see signals coming out of Tehran to cooperate and help Yemenis to achieve peace. Iran is using Yemen as a testing ground to, to, to develop 
the range of the, their, their missiles and the, the technologies of the drones. Do you know how much it costs to operate a drone in Yemen that will kill two, three, four, and maim others? It costs only less than $45. The drone in the market is less than $40. And the, and the explosive they use, it only costs $3. So with this, they can create a little uh, arm. And what will happen if they send 50, 60 of these drones to attack? Then we are repeating the history of uh, Noah Harari in his latest book about uh, 21 lessons of the 21st century, when he said that, that these um, terrorist groups in the, in the, in the world, they are in, 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 in envisaging and, and testing ways of using drones in, 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 in big amount to, to make m much damage in, in their terrorist attacks. And this is what Iran is doing. Uh, that's why we will keep on talking about Iran, because Iran is destroying Yemen. Iran, through, through Hezbollah and through all these militias they have, and the Houthis in Yemen, they try to destabilize uh, peace and security in the region. And we will fight against the, 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 the hegemon policies of Iran. And, and we, that's why we support the, all the policies of the, of the United States uh, government uh, when it comes to putting Iran and the, 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 the Republican Guard into the terrorist list. And we think that Iran is responsible of all these acts of, of, of evil in our region. And we need, with the international cooperation, to stop Iran from doing that. I think I will stop here. And, and, and I, will, uh, I will be more open for discussions and, and, and details uh, through the, the leadership of our vice president. So thank you for those, uh, I'd say, sobering remarks on the, on the challenges. Um, just one quick follow-up on the, on the Stockholm Agreement. You mentioned uh, uh, the difficulties around the uh, uh, understanding around ties. Um, the the, sh the um, statement on a shared understanding called for the establishment of a joint committee that would be include civil society, the UN. Has there has there been further discussion about that at all? And, and what do you how do you see that developing? Just just and to what be, is it, what is it, what is the be, goal of it? Yeah, to be fair enough, the UN team, the special envoy office, is stretched out with with only the Hodeida. If you think how much of efforts they are doing on Hodeida you will understand that the, the office of the special envoy is doing a great job. And if you see on, on the on negotiation of the prisoners and, 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 and kidnappings, uh, uh, swap or exchange, you see that they're doing huge efforts. And, uh, and they, try, they, they try the first contact of the two parties on how they see uh, this understanding on ties can, can go on, but they realize that the I mean, the, the Houthis are asking so much questions on mm -hmm. how they see, the, in, in their view, uh, the implementation of the ties understanding. Also, the government is asking for, for them to open all access. And, and, and it's still, we are still far from, for, from coming into the common ground where we can start talking about how to lift siege over, over ties. Mm -hmm. But it will take time. But I think that the priority is on, on Hodeida and on the prisoner uh, exchange. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, broad, broadening out the, the conversation for a moment, I mean, I appreciate that Hodeida is, is, uh, is the first step to a larger process, but um, the, uh, the, the Stockholm Agreement brought together two parties, the internationally recognized government of Yemen, the armed Houthi movement, mediated by the UN, facilitated by a neutral member state, Sweden. It sort of represents kind of a very classic model of what would appear to be a, a traditional civil war. But the conflict um, in Yemen is, is, is much more complex and, and multifaceted than that. Um, and this represents a, a broader, broader trends in armed conflicts that you're seeing even beyond, beyond Yemen. Regionalization of the conflict, uh, proliferation of armed actors and rising humanitarian consequences uh, for civilians. And this all makes conflict much more difficult to resolve. 
Um, you mentioned the broader regional uh, component, which adds complexity. But the government of Yemen and the armed Houthi movement are also not the only domestic armed actors in the country. Um, there are many more, Salafists, there's a Southern Separatist yeah. movement, uh, long-standing uh, other groups. At, at some point, will um, a political process bring them in? Um, and how can the, uh, the UN community help facilitate that? Yeah, uh, and, and we thought in, in Stockholm that we really were in a very uh, a special moment where we could see a turning turning out of of, uh, of this conflict into something implementable. We we can start moving in this process down the street of of, of the urban peace. Uh, but then we we realized that uh, it was the regional impact that made that impossible because the changing mood of Iran, so and, and, and the sort of relations that and and, and I you dis, you discover when you talk to people how much Iran is involved. You thought. Sometimes you say in the room, okay, people talk about Iran, but when you talk to uh, senior officers in Europe and ministers and all that, they said Iranians are involved in, in, in facilitating this process, and, uh, but they are not willing to do that because they are looking for rewards. So uh, it makes, uh, I mean, a very strike, uh, uh, I mean, discovery that Yemen without Iran uh, I mean, we can, if this, this regional impact is not there, we can solve our problem much easier. Mm -hmm. So this is this is question one. But you, you brought in, in this uh, question like 10 questions in one, <laughs> that which make, which make, uh, make it uh, I mean, uh, difficult for me to, to, to address every, every, every part of it. But let me talk about the participation of every ingredient in the society. Um, of course, uh, the, 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 the war, the national dialogue before it, the conflict itself started when the, the sudden movement started these uh, claims of, 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 of rights and, and the, the right to uh, secession of the South. Uh, and it's, it's really a very uh, uh, rightful uh, request by, 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 the, by the South. But what happened in the national dialogue, we agreed that the South will have this format of settlement of the, that we will move into a federal state, then this federal state can bring new fresh discussions on what will happen next. But the Southern Movement, uh, during the conflict with the Houthis, they jumped again uh, to the floor of discussion to, to bring this issue again, that no, it's now that we need to, to secede. Okay, we said, we agree in the national dialogue that first we establish our national priorities, then we go into to local priorities. Uh, we stuck with them because they moved into looking for regional partners. Then we are again talking about the regional impact of the conflict in Yemen. But, but they went into, into regional influencing to find their ways out of the conflict by getting the South. But, but in the discussion, I remember when I was the permanent representative of Yemen here, the president asked me to go and talk with STC in, in the beginning of their establishment. And I went to Abu Dhabi and I saw them. All these leaders you see now, the, they said, okay, how you gain legitimacy? Because leg legitimacy in international law can be gained all through referendum, all through elections. They said, no, we are representative of the South, and this is, and I'm from the South. And they asked me to join them to be their speaker representative. I said, no, I'm, I'm enough to represent Yemen, and I think I will not serve anymore because I'm old enough to continue uh, in, in, in politics. Then I said, there is no legitimacy. Who is the really the, the armed uh, branch of the STC? It's the same reputation of Yemen conflict that goes from the independence of South Yemen when the National Front destroyed the, 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 the Arab Front, what they call it, the, the, the Liberation uh, Front, and took over as the representative of the South by force. <clears throat> so using force is something historic 
in, in Yemen to empower yourself. I said, if you don't use force to empower yourself and act as a political partner, we will welcome you. <coughs> Today in Aden, when I visited Aden uh, last month, I realized that everything is peaceful because they don't have instructions to use arms. If they don't use arms and keep talking politics, they are welcome. And even they will have a share when we settle this conflict with the Houthis to talk the future of Yemen, to, to sort out all our grievances. But we think that we cannot fragmentate Yemen and bring more ingredients into this conflict and make it impossible for us to, to settle. We think that the big issue now, we need to talk to the Houthis, try to sort out the, the major conflict of Yemen, of the establishment. Then we will move into talking about the new constitution, what will happen to the federal state, if everybody is on board on the, the structure of six, six components of that federal state. Step by step, we can take it. But we cannot go and open all the, 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 the Pandora box because we want to, to address the Salafis issue, we want to address the Southern Movement issue, we want to address the Houthi issue, we want to address so many, even the Hadrami issue, why not? So uh, this is the big issue. We have a lot of challenges in, in Yemen, but if we agree together that we can take it step by step, we will be more than happy to address it. The president was very happy in accommodating Ansarullah into this process. You know that Ansarullah were in, they're out in bushes and they, he asked them, in. he invited them to be part and parcel of this pro political process. Then they kidnapped the state by force by using these, I mean, uh, uh, grievances between Saleh and, and all the, 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 the challenges that we face with the former president of Yemen. It's mm. too complicated to, to sort it out in this very easy uh, discussion. But you, you brought a lot of questions in, in, <laughs> in, in one. I have, I have more questions on the Pandora's box, but I'll, 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 refrain, I'll refrain from that and ask you one more actually clarification on, on Hodeida and we can, then we can open, open the floor. Um, the, the agreement or lack thereof on the local security forces that would take the place of, uh, of both the government forces and uh, Houthi forces when they are redeployed is critical to the, um, to the agreement as, as written. Um, but it seems to be a real fundamental uh, challenge. Yeah. challenge. Yeah. Is, is there a way to um, move forward in lieu of, a, of an agreement on the uh, composition of those forces? Are there operational, uh, I understand there's some operational details that are being discussed. Can you tell us about that? Look, talk, talking to the SG, he's mm -hmm. I mean, he's visionary in, when it comes to how we implement the Hadid yeah. agreement. We say, okay, you just stop talking about anything else. We just push them out of Hodeida mm -hmm. and, and reallocate the government forces out of Hodeida. Then what will happen in Hodeida? Of course, it will be the local administration that we need the local administration, we need the local policing to take over. Mm -hmm. So this is the rhetoric that there is, okay, the Houthis, they said, okay, if we withdraw tomorrow from Hodeida, the coalition forces and the Yemeni government will take over. This is one myth. The second one, they said, okay, then who will be defending the UN presence in Hodeida if we leave? They, they consider themselves as part of Hodeida, so they cannot move out of Hodeida. So we said, in our concept, uh, and, and every time Martin was coming to the president to explain this idea, the president was, was, was emphatic enough. So okay, whenever we have an issue, we have the tripartite commission. So it's RCC. The RCC, the uh, Redeployment uh, Committee, was established based on this idea, the tripartite participation. We should sit there, and Sarala should sit there, and the UN should sit there. Whenever we have a discussion on small, major conflict, we come and discuss it. When, when they accepted the idea in, in, in 18 February to withdraw, then they changed their mind. They said, no, we cannot withdraw because of this issue. Uh, we, the president told them, okay, we are not introducing policing to the Kilo 8. Kilo 8, there is a chunk of, of there is a place. It, we should withdraw. The government should withdraw to open the humanitarian access and make it easy for the Houthis not to feel the threat. 
because kilo eight is the most important advanced triangle that the army come into Hodeida, close to the seaport, and they are afraid of that area. So we are withdrawing from that area to give them more assurances that nobody is attacking them. But in return, they, 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 they never accepted the tripartite inspection on Hodeida, Salif, and Ras Isa. We said, in everywhere we withdraw, we need an inspection of the three party components. They cannot. This is the future of Hodeida. If you look what will happen in Hodeida, if we withdraw and they withdraw, then we can have the three partite inspections everywhere. We will work on the policing, local policing. We only require that the local policing should be clean from Houthi inspections, inspectors, and from the Houthi new generals. Because you see a young man having a rank of general. And you say, how come a general takes 30, 30, 40 years before arriving into that rank? And you see a man, a militia man, having a general rank. Said the UN even, they said, no, we cannot accept that. Because a general should come through the military academy and having this experience. And we know we have the list ready and we discuss it with the UN. So, okay, from the 450 Coast Guards that should uh, uh, defend Hodeida, Salif, and Ras Isa, the three seaports, now there is only 125. We said, okay, bring the rest according to the law. But remove your militiamen and remove those who are having uniforms with generals and colonels out and only keep those who used to work there, even if they are sympathizers of the Houthis. This is very important because you say, no, you will bring people sympathizers to the government. No, no, no. Those who are working in Hodeida, even they are, if they are all sympathizers of Houthis, it's okay with, the, with us. But they should be legal coming through legal procedure and according to 2014, uh, I mean, uh, servicemen uh, in, in Hodeida. So this is the question that will solve the, the problem of Hodeida. They don't understand the idea of withdrawal and leaving Hodeida. They think that they can stay in Hodeida, the UN can stay in Hodeida, and the government should leave. And this is how we keep discussing with them, with Martin, and Martin, decided not to open this discussion. We said, we have the first stage, because if you see the old agreement of Hodeida, it says in the first four days, they need to withdraw from Salif, Hodeida, Ras Isa. But we, we couldn't do it, because now four, after four months, I mean, so many four days passed without uh, implementing the, the withdrawals from the three seaports. Okay, they will withdraw, we will withdraw from Kilo 8 that we have not established in the old agreement. Then, after they, they established these first four uh, withdrawals, we will discuss the local authority, mm -hmm. the local policing, and all this stuff. We already give the, the UN our list according to 2014. We are not asking to, to send somebody supporter of the government. We ask all those who used to work in Hodeida even if they are sympathizers of the Houthis or the government or so whatsoever. So this is the, basically how we see the future of Hodeida. So what's really the importance of Hodeida as a pilot project? If we manage to agree on working together in Hodeida, then we can agree on working together in Yemen. They will be part of Yemen, but not as a militiamen. They will be part of Yemen as a political movement. They will be sitting everywhere in government, in cities, everywhere according to their load, to their real level of influence. But they know the Houthis because they are only can flourish through war. They cannot take peace because they know that if they take the initiative of peace, they will disappear. And they are afraid of disappearing in the peace process. That's why they are rejecting the idea of, come on, let's work together. They can not work with you because they want to work having their arms and ammunition on them. So they, they, they feel that they are more strong in, in putting more leverage of other when they are a, a, a militia uh, component, not a political component. Mm. This is the, the challenge. But I no... think I explained what will be the, the future of Hodeida and Yemen if they understand the tripartite mm. component of, of it. 
but there's there's no discussion in the Stockholm Agreement or elsewhere on disarmament yet. That's that's wouldn't no, no, no. What we, we, we ask them just to withdraw. Yeah. They can take their arms and withdraw. The, the disarmament will be another stage when we are dealing with the political process. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. We'll. Uh, I think we'll open up the floor. Yes, here in the middle. So. Now, bring a microphone and please introduce yourself for the webcast. My name is Bani Dugal. I rep represent the Baha'i international community to the UN. Thank you, Excellency, for your uh, remarks. Uh, you shared a little bit about the progress of the Stockholm Agreement regarding Hodeida and Thais, but uh, could you also tell us how the prisoner exchange is progressing, if at all? Thank you. Great, thanks. We'll take a, we'll take a couple of questions. Yes, here to the... Um, Alessandro Soretti. Uh, Minister, the, um, the White House is deciding uh, and will decide over the next few days whether to veto the uh, War Powers Resolution that was passed in Congress concerning uh, U.S. support for the, for the coalition. And uh, my, my question would be, given the controversy that it's caused and that it's been causing is, uh, you know, to what extent this will impact uh, the negotiations if there is a presidential veto and what your view is uh, of what the uh, US administration should do. Great, thank you. Two very concise questions. Well done. Uh, what well, we can take one more before we come back to the minister. Did I see one over here? I thought, no. Uh, yeah, here up front. Um, yeah, um, my name is Fred Parman and thank you for your thoughts first. Um, I'm just wondering if, so to come to compromise, you mentioned that the Houthi are fearing the peace because they might disappear. But for me, I was also thinking about, we haven't discussed the, the, the complete role of Saudi Arabia in this conflict. And I think if you, or don't, or is it a question if the Houthis are also fearing that when they step step back and there's still backup from Saudi Arabia, that um, an alternative to negotiation. So, for example, that Saudi Arabia and the government of Yemen is then so strong to have a better alternative than a negotiation that this might be a reason why they are not stepping down. Thank you. Oh, let me uh, on the Baha'i. Uh, our oh, oh, friend from the Baha'i movement, and, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to see her around. And, uh, and you know, in the, in, the, in the prisoner exchange, we have also an issue of Baha'is, and we insisted when we presented our list uh, as a government uh, to have uh, those Baha'is arrested by the Houthis. Houthis are using uh, uh, the, the Baha'i element because upon instructions from Tehran, they are trying they know, you know the history of Baha'is and the suffering in Iran. And Iran is, is uh, always, when, when it comes to uh, its international interventions and, 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 and everywhere in the world, they go after the Baha'is because they know that Baha'is have a right in Iran and they, 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 they lost a lot of their properties, their rights by the Mullah's regime. We, we are supportive of the, of, of the Baha'is because it's, it's a human right and we keep fighting and struggling uh, to, to, to get everybody free from the, from the Houthi prisoners. On, on, on the, 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 the veto, of the administration veto, we think that uh, we understand the, 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 the discussion in, in, in Washington, D.C. And we know that Democrats and are using uh, the, 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 the war in, in, in Yemen uh, as, as, as a domestic leverage in the fight with the administration. Uh, the, I mean, if, if you are talking about Obama, Obama were supportive of the, of the, of the war. He started the, the, the process of supporting uh, the coalition in, in this war, and he opened all, I mean, then they changed their mind. But the idea that Obama and the Democratic Party was supportive of this war in Yemen and supportive of the legitimate government. But I think it's more of a domestic conflict than, than of, of a strategic approach. And I do believe that the veto will, will, will continue uh, giving the support of the coalition because 
Otherwise, we send the wrong message to Iran that they can't continue their policies of destabilizing the region. And uh, I don't want to go further, but I, my understanding that we will continue supporting the, uh, the Trump administration because it's working to, to discipline the, 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 the mullah's regime and, and, and its uh, uh, destabilizing activities in the region. Um, it's a very interesting question on the Saudis. Uh, if, if we go to international law, we, go th we, we understand that the Saudi involvement is in Yemen is fully in, 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 in adherence to, to international law because it was Article 51 that President of the Republic on the 24th of March uh, 2015 when he sent that note to the, to the Security Council and the, to, to the Secretary General. And I sent that note when I was here, the permanent representative who called for the international participation to help Yemen uh, against the Houthi uh, aggression. So Saudi Arabia, uh, United Arab Emirates, and other 11 countries decided to take uh, the invitation. And, to, and if you uh, read Article 51, it's really exactly giving legitimacy to our, our, our participation in Yemen and the coalition participation in Yemen. And uh, according to that, one, uh, after 15, 15 days, we had what United States uh, was not able to have in, in its war in Afghanistan and Iraq. We had a resolution under our Article 7 of the Charter, which is 2216, that empower us to fight to recover Yemen from the Iranian uh, pro Houthi, pro, from the uh, Houthi pro Iranian uh, militia in Yemen. See, according to international law, the participation of Saudi Arabia is totally and fully uh, within the international agreements and, and international law and, and, and the UN Charter. And we know that somebody will say, okay, Saudi Arabia has a hegemon approach like Iran, but we, we never see that hegemon approach in Yemen. Saudi Arabia could help in, in the construction of Yemen, in the development of Yemen for the, for the last 60 years, Saudi Arabia, uh, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, and other GCC countries contributed to the, to the peace and stability of Yemen. And they came under, under request of the President of the Republic to help Yemenis recover their statehood. This is what, that, what we think. Yes, here in the back, please. Oh, hello, sir. Uh, my name is Aditya Ketkar. I'm an uh, intern working at United Nations Democracy Fund. Uh, now, I, uh, uh, I mean, I've heard your replies about all the three questions. I, I believe you haven't answered the prisoner exchange in detail uh, from the lady who is representing the Baha'i community here. Uh, apart from that, uh, well, I understand your point of involving Saudi Arabia into Yemen on the request of the Yemenian authorities. But when we have an example of 1971, the pro-Soviet Afghan government requesting Soviet Union to invade into Afghanistan and help them to uh, maintain their regime, isn't it something similar when the Saudi lead coalition is kind of invading? And as you just said with your own words, uh, it's always better for the Yemenis to solve their, resolve their own problems without any uh, international involvement. So when you're denying uh, or when you're asking Iran to stay away from Yemen, isn't it quite logical to ask the other Saudi lead coalition also to stay away from the Yemen so that even the Houthis would get an assurance of not getting annihilated from their own country? I mean, that's my sincere question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one more up here in the front, yeah. Hello. Yeah, hi, I'm Foreign Minister. Thanks so much for the briefing. Um, one clarification and one question. It's James Reinald from Middle East, I, by the way. Um, in your opening remarks, you referred to a Houthi shelling of the Red Sea Mills area during one of Lola's guards' visits. I just wasn't clear. Is that a recent event you're talking about? And if it's in the last few days, yeah, can you give this, this is for the third time. The shelling is for the third time. And the, the recent one was two days ago. Um, it'd be great if you can give us some more details on that, because I haven't yeah. seen it reported. Um, my question is about the UAE and their involvement in the conflict. 
given their designs to control ports around the Indian Ocean and the Horn of Africa, and given their strong ties to the southern secessionist movement in Yemen, are you not concerned about their long-term interests in your country? Take uh, one more before we come back, or? Okay, I think you've got, you've got uh, some work to do there on those questions. Okay. <laughs> Okay, my, 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 my friend there with, with this uh, sort of uh, comparing question of, of Afghanistan and, and Yemen. Let me just explain what, ha what, what happened in Afghanistan was totally, when you read the scenarios led, led, leading to the, to the Soviet intervention in, 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 in Afghanistan, it was a Lakayo regime I mean, close to, to, to Russia that was collapsing in, in Afghanistan. But in Yemen, it was not a pro-Saudi regime that was established in Yemen and were looking for Saudi help because we were colony of the, of the, of the Saudis. This should be rectified when you, when, you, when you approach to the Yemeni conflict. Yemen was a sovereign state, very active in international politics, Members of the member of the United Nations, one of the best scenarios when it comes to to dealing with the Arab Spring uh, after my, uh, Yemen managed with the international presence. Uh, of course, the second step: Yemen is a democratic, uh, democratic, republican structure. GCC countries have a different sort of approach when it comes to governance. Nothing to do, okay? The, 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 the other issue, Yemen was a, a very unique case with it, in, in, in its cooperation with the United Nations. They, they were together in ejecting former Saleh from, from the government and establishing the, what we call it, the GCC initiative and, and outcome document of the national dialogue. The implementation of the GCC was a UN baby, was not a Saudi baby, and, uh, and, and, and the, the national dialogue was unique about the Middle East, where for the first time we established the 30% of women participation, democratization of the society, addressing all grievances during the last 60 years, and this is nothing to do with the region. We are not, I mean, uh, when it comes to Yemen, what a unique example of international involvement in a country to help this country through the paths of, of, of salvation, which is taking you into the, the full mistaken approach of, of mixing two phenomena. Saudi Arabia came to the war in Yemen after this war was already uh, uh, established by Houthis arriving into Aden and attacking the president even when he left Sana'a to Aden, trying to continue the dialogue in Yemen and stop this war. They continue. Iran was in, in full speed to take Yemen. That's why the leadership in Iran was thinking that they captured the fourth Arab capital. You remember that? They keep saying that today we captured the fourth Arab capital, thinking that Yemen was already their case. And in my discussion with, with, uh, with with, with, when the Amer United States invited me to Warsaw to talk in that conference, I said, look, Yemen is still a case of a free country fighting to recover the statehood. Lebanon is a lost case. I can argue with you 10, 15 hours, because Hezbollah today is in full control of Lebanon. If you want to uproot Hezbollah from, from Lebanon, you need to uproot the entire nation. To, to take it out. But in Yemen, Houthis are in, 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 in losing their control of the country because of this struggle to regain. Who is fighting on the ground is Yemeni army. It's not Saudi army. The coalition is giving support to the Yemeni army all over the country. We have difficulties, but this is a sovereign nation fighting to recover its statehood. Thank you, sir. And on, on the Emirati issue, uh, look, the declared position of United 
Arab Emirates in this conflict, full support to the legitimate government, full support to the coalition, part under the leadership of, uh, of, of, of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the leader of this coalition, to work for Yemenis to recover their statehood in full support of President Hadi legitimacy. What you said, hypothetically, we don't know about. We recognize what is really in the text written and pronounced by politicians from the United States, the United Arab Emirates. They might be, because, because conspiracy theories can be on a daily basis presented to the, to the market, but we never believe in, in conspiracies. Thank you. We have uh, time for one, uh, one or two more questions. If uh, Yes, here at the left. Hi, thank you. Um, Judy Shu with uh, Global Citizen. I just had a question regarding the access to humanitarian aid that you had mentioned earlier and what is being done in terms of addressing hunger and access to food by civilians on a day-to-day -day basis right now. Thank you. And uh, one more here, yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Foreign Minister. I have a question. Given the concern that you have expressed in terms of the lack of commitment by the Houthis to implement the Stockholm Agreement, how credible is this fear that diplomacy has already run its course and Yemen is once again uh, headed to, towards another armed conflict? Yeah. Thank you. We can, if there's one more, we can take one more. OK. Uh, Actually, may, may, maybe can I add one, one more question because I want to add a more hope, maybe a hope, more hopeful question to the to the mix. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the national dialogue uh, several times, um, and uh, in IPI's work uh, research on, on on women, peace, and security, the national dialogue has come up um, as before the war, Yemen was making real real progress in taking uh, significant steps in, in improving the participation of women and youth um, in the in the political process. Um, and Yemen's uh, women's networks were very strong and, and admired by many. It's come up in, in some of our, in our conversations. Um, we also know that from uh, research on peace processes, that uh, peace processes that include the participation of women, women's networks and such, are more, uh, have a higher chance of success, uh, both in meet, reading, reaching an agreement and one that is uh, sustainable. Um, is there, how, how can, how can, Yemen, the government of Yemen and the UN uh, leverage that incredible wealth of experience that Yemen has from the national dialogue to inject some of that into the current, current process. This is, the, this is my fight from day one when I came to office. I think that, and this is a political statement and I will keep repeating it, it everywhere. I think that Yemen woman is much better and more capable of leading the country than men. I think we contributed to the destruction, men, when it comes to men leadership, we contributed to the destruction of Yemen and, and the lack of, of, of wisdom. That we said in history that Yemen is the, cent the, the country of wisdom. And I think that we lost wisdom because our men lost vision. But I, I do believe that women in Yemen can, can lead this country out of, the, of, the, of this war. And I do believe that if we give women, uh, and this is, was, was my request from day one, why we agree in the national dialogue to give women 30% and we're still waiting to recover Yemen to give women 30%. Why we can't give women now 30% of, of share in every level of governance? I do believe that women should take uh, by every means its positive and, and leadership role in Yemen now not tomorrow, not we recover. I think this will contribute to the defeat of the Houthis and the ideas of, 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 of expansionism, in, in uh, Iranian expansionism in Yemen. <laughs> and uh, this is my, my conviction. And uh, when we discussed that in the, in the National Dialogue, Ansar Allah were there. The Houthis were sitting there. President Hadi invited them to the, to the, and even we tried to give them a political name. We said Houthis is not a name for a political movement. Find out more switchable names. Then they agreed to call themselves Ansar Allah. We said much better name like Hezbollah, Ansar Allah. It seems that all the pro-Iranians are, are all Allah's uh, close uh, 
I mean, uh, names. So this is the idea. We said, find yourself a name to be recognized with, then, then come and join us at the political movement. He invited them, he did a lot of, I mean, he presented everything possible for them to, to succeed in talking to others and discuss. Then they decided to kidnap the state by force because they cannot flourish. Again, I'm repeating the same idea. They cannot flourish as a political movement. They can only flourish as a military militia. And this is very difficult for them to coexist with others, leaving uh, the, the militia part of, of, the, of the equation out of, uh, of, of the political discussion. On, on the humanitarian uh, issue, I think that in, in, in Hodeida, we managed to tell the international community that we will do everything it takes to make the humanitarian relief operations more, more accessible, more, more, more easy to go uh, to, to, to every, every corner of the nation where the needy people are waiting for, for, for the international, uh, very uh, important contribution uh, to help Yemenis. Uh, you remember last year, the, the, the UN uh, appeal was, was getting three, almost three billion uh, US dollars. This, this, uh, this year, the, the US OCHA appeal was getting 2.6 billion. Uh, and, and we are speeding up the process of, of distributing. We still having some difficulties. I think that this Stockholm agreement is intend to open access and, and, and free the, the, the movement of, of humanitarian relief operations through Hodeida, through aid, and through other accesses to all over the country to reach those in need. Uh, we think that also the government is working on the other side of this equation to lesser the, the, the number of, of needy people in Yemen. What we are doing now, we are paying almost 65% of the entire salaries in the nation. Nevertheless, the Houthis are not cooperating, but we are accessing, uh, accessing uh, every corner of the country by may, making payment of salaries. We are paying now, in areas controlled by the Houthis, we are paying to the health care sector, we are paying to the university sectors, we are paying to the, to the, to the schools shortly, and we paid in Hodeida. Nevertheless, they are not, cooperating with the central bank in Aden, but we paid two, two months' salaries in Hodeida. So this is the idea of trying to reduce the number of needs so that the, the humanitarian relief operation can complement the efforts of the government in, in, in Aden. Uh, on, on the possibility of this war uh, coming back, and, and uh, really, this is a very interesting question. What we did in Stockholm we say it very publicly everywhere that we think that this is the end of the war. But for this war to end, we need to implement Stockholm. And we, we create more trust building measures. Then we go step by step into the final settlement. But Houthis are not willing to, to take that. If we lose this momentum that we created in, in Stockholm, we will go to another round, fresh round of conflict that might take us for another four years. Let me just give you a reading, very, uh, uh, very straightforward reading of what happened. This war started in 2015. We, we, we waited f four months, five months, then we started the first contacts to get to understand if we can reach peace. It was impossible. Then we, we, the, 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 po the possibility of peace collapsed until 2016 when we went to Kuwait. Then in Kuwait, we failed. Then the international community gave up with us. Then we waited for 2018, uh, December 18, which means almost three years from, from Kuwait. If this chance and momentum created in Stockholm collapsed, then we will have to, the international community will give up with us and we will wait for another four years of, 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 of really drastic uh, confrontation and killing and maiming our people and destroying Yemen because we, we cannot agree with the Houthis to stop this war. So this is the picture. Mm -hmm. It's very, I mean, uh, illustrative and it's very sad, but I'm telling you, we, we cannot believe that this momentum should collapse 
with your support, with the support of the international community, with the work of the special envoy and the Secretary General, we need to push hard for the Houthis to understand that's the last moment of this war and we need to wrap it up. Mm. This is my idea. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. I think that's actually a great uh, uh, summary to the to where the process stands and where where it's it's heading. And uh, I think we're we're about out of time. I know you have a further meetings across the street, uh, and so I promised that we'd end a bit early. Um, but all I can say is that um, we we fully uh, support the commitment to implementing the Stockholm Agreement. I think we all agree that that is essential. And to the extent that there is worry that the international community might give up on Yemen, I can say that uh, um, IPI will remain uh, committed following this issue and, uh, and support uh, the search for peace in Yemen. Uh, and uh, thank you uh, very much for your uh, update. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.